Discord. All right, let's get started. So thanks for joining me this morning. We're gonna be doing a workshop on pantry cooking. So we'll go over why pantry cooking is so great, some ideas and inspiration for recipes and strategies to avoid extra grocery shopping. And we'll also be doing um, a couple little exercises throughout the presentation to get you thinking about how you can cook from your own pantry after this workshop. Um, and then after the PowerPoint, I'll be cooking a couple of dishes that are made with pantry ingredients. And I hope that you'll give one of them a try this week. Before we get started, just um, if you could keep yourself muted unless you're sharing with the group, asking a question, making a comment or something like that. Um, you can ask me questions throughout by either unmuting yourself or typing in the chat. And I'm going to quickly share a poll um, that will pop up on your screen. And we're just required to collect this information for our federal reports. So if you could just take a second to fill that out, it's anonymous. While you're doing that, let's dive right in. So first of all, what is pantry cooking anyway? Um, so there are two interpretations I found that are similar, but not exactly the same. First, pantry cooking can be just making a meal with what you already have on hand in your house. And another definition is cooking with non-perishable foods like canned, jarred, or dried food like pasta. Why practice pantry cooking? So a lot of great reasons. The first and foremost for me is saving money. Um, you avoid taking extra trips to the grocery store, which is especially important right now during the pandemic when we're trying to avoid making extra trips into public. It also helps you clean out your pantry, fridge, and freezer, make room for more things, keep things less cluttered. And of course, it helps prevent food waste. And we all know how important that is, not just for saving money, but for helping the environment as well. All right, now, before we get started, I just wanted to do one quick icebreaker. And that is, what is one ingredient that has been in your pantry or freezer for months? And you can either type it into the chat or unmute yourself to share. Um, so let me see, for me, one of mine, oh, it was fish sausage. I had, someone made fish sausage. And so I had to look up a recipe that um, I ended up using uh, the fish sausage for a pasta sauce, which was really good. It was like Creole style. Um, Martha says herbs, dried herbs are always one. Frozen veggies, well, we'll give you some ideas today to use up some of those frozen veggies. I love always keeping a bag of frozen veggies in my freezer. Anyone else? Fish, chicken breast got lost. I do that all the time. That's another benefit of cleaning out your fridge and freezer really regularly is because otherwise things just get lost in your freezer. Chicken breast. It was a game changer when I found out that you could cook frozen meats in your Instant Pot from frozen. So that's something we've been trying. Mochi, hmm. Using mochi, that would be a tough one. Frozen mashed bananas, right? I have so many of those as well. <laughs> and it's like, you can only make so much banana bread and smoothies. Sometimes you want something different. <laughs> well, maybe we'll, we'll be able to brainstorm. Um, so can we think of any recipes that might give purpose to some of these items? So does anybody like have a recipe for frozen bananas that we haven't thought of or shrimp? Well, actually we were just talking about making garlic butter shrimp that it's so easy and that's a great way to use shrimp. Just serve it over rice. Fish. Any ideas for fish? What kind of fish? That was Patricia. 
One thing that I've been making a lot with fish is a coconut stew, like a coconut tomato stew with fish. Hmm, small reef fish. Yeah, that one's probably better fried then. That's all we do. Oh, Lavon is gonna ask her brother for a recipe with shrimp. Elaine, you mean ulu? Or is that something else? I like putting ulu in curries. That's my favorite thing to do with breadfruit. Yeah, awesome, great ideas. We'll have to keep thinking about the frozen bananas one. There's gotta be something out there that we're missing. All right, moving on. So building your pantry cooking skills. You can improve your abilities with pantry cooking with just a few steps and some practice. So first, of course, you need a pantry, fridge, and freezer that are gonna be stocked with ingredients that you know that you already enjoy eating. And we'll go over that next to help you get started. As always, you wanna make a meal plan to use what you have before making unnecessary shopping trips. One thing that I found is helpful is learning to embrace substitutions in recipes that you already make, whether it's using different vegetables, cheeses, or proteins. Um, so you get comfortable with um, mixing and matching with what you have available. You'll also want to try some new recipes that use non-perishable items. Um, you know, the first time that you try something new is always gonna be the hardest. So if you make something new every week, I've found that you'll, you'll eventually find a few recipes that you like that you can make with whatever you have on hand. And don't worry, we'll go over lots of recipe ideas later in the presentation to give you some inspiration. And lastly, get creative. You'll want to look for ideas that use items you already have at home and practice using pantry staples in new ways. For example, this picture here, um, is one of my favorite new things. It's called shakshuka. Have you guys ever had shakshuka before? It's poached eggs in a spiced tomato sauce. And you can add whatever vegetables you have on hand. Sweet potato goes really well in that. You can make it with just leftover jarred pasta sauce. Um, or if you have diced tomatoes on hand, things like that. So once you've made that once, I guarantee you're gonna love it. And so you can get more comfortable doing that in the future. Um, I've learned you can use salsa to poach fish and you can marinate meat and salad dressing. So just learning to try some, some new ideas with things that you already have and keep on hand. So we're just gonna go over some recommended things to keep in your pantry to make pantry cooking easier. Um, so this list includes non-perishable items like cans and jars. And these are really just the basics. So the next time you're at the grocery store, I'd encourage you to take a minute to check out the canned and jarred food section and see if it gives you any recipe ideas. For example, the other day I saw artichoke hearts and I was like, ooh, you can make a dip with, with artichoke hearts. So I looked it up and you can do frozen spinach, canned artichoke hearts, and then cream cheese to make a dip. You can also make canned clams into a pasta sauce. Um, you know, to avoid overstocking on things, ideally you should come up with ideas and look up recipes before you buy something new. So you'd already have a plan for whatever you're gonna try. Then you can make it once to see how it turns out. And if you want, you can start to keep it in your meal rotation. And since this is my first time doing this presentation, I'd really love to hear from all of you. Is there anything that you keep stocked in your house that isn't on this list? Peanut butter. Oh, I've got peanut butter on there because I always keep peanut butter around. It's great for making, you know, Asian style sauces as well as, you know, the basics, peanut butter and jelly. Um, I like to keep Mabo tofu sauce in my house um, and a package of tofu. Anything else you guys like to keep on hand in your house? Oh, nice suggestion from Jill. If you want to use Ulu, the Ulu Co-op has lots of Ulu recipes like hummus, which is great. Oh, sesame oil and mirin. Yes, sesame oil is 
a must have. And Mirin too is something we like to keep stocked. Anything else to add? You can always add things into the chat after we move on too. So if you have a freezer and a fridge, they're also great tools for ensuring that you can always make a delicious meal without going to the store. They can both help you store longer lasting perishable items like frozen foods and some dairy products. So I always keep ground beef and frozen greens in my freezer. We always have cream cheese, butter and hard cheese in the fridge and those items can last for a long time. So we always have some kind of dairy options to add flavor and richness when I'm trying to make dinner last minute. And don't forget about produce. Certain fruits and vegetables can last a long time in the fridge or in the pantry. So you can easily keep at least some fresh food on hand. If possible, you guys probably know this, but you always want aromatics to make a flavor base for all your different meals. So that's onions, garlic, and ginger. If there's a high quality butternut squash or kabocha available, that can last for months without, without refrigeration. Uh, sweet potatoes are another longer lasting option. Something to keep in mind with sweet potatoes is if you get, you wanna make sure that you inspect them for damage, specifically insect damage if they're local, because if you get weevils eggs inside of them or something like that, sometimes the weevils hatch out and eat your sweet potatoes. And so that'll make them not last as long. But if you have really good quality sweet potatoes, those can last a while. And I always keep cabbage and carrots in my fridge because they can last for months in the right conditions. One thing to keep in mind with the carrots, if you buy like a bag of those baby carrots, sometimes there's a lot of moisture in the bottom of the bag. And so that can make them kind of mold sooner than they otherwise would. So if you're going to do that, I would just drain out that moisture before you store them in your fridge. I've also started keeping radishes in the fridge. Those are root vegetables, so they last a long time. And they're a really nice addition to like a tofu kimchi stew that I make, or also as a garnish for Mexican food or salads. They add some nice color and crunch. And of course, when you start pantry cooking more, you still want to avoid wasting food whenever possible. So always practice the first in, first out principle when it comes to both fresh and non-perishable food. Use your fresh ingredients first. So try to use up your fresh vegetables before turning to your frozen or canned ones. And if your fresh food is going to spoil, try to turn it into something that you can freeze, like spaghetti sauce is a good one. And if you can, I know this is tough. Some of you are probably more organized than others. I'm trying to get better about this, but get in the habit of dating your food when it goes into the freezer or if you open it. And don't go crazy buying new non-perishable foods without a plan. My rule of thumb is don't buy ingredients for the first time unless you'll use them this week. This way I won't buy a bunch of canned seafood I've never tried without a recipe in mind already. So playing with the basics. If you don't have any ideas, you, can, you usually can't go wrong with this flexible format of a starch, a protein, a vegetable, and some kind of sauce, as long as those all kind of go together flavor-wise. Um, it helps to keep fresh flavor boosters on hand. So I mentioned I like to keep dairy around. Citrus and fresh herbs are other things that can help mix up the flavor of basic things like beans or plain chicken breasts. Um, so what you can do is make big batches of your basics and then diversify those. So make a big batch of chicken or beans or beef plain and then turn it into a salad, then a soup, then a sandwich and a dip, something like that. Um, it also helps if you're an experienced chef, you might already be pretty comfortable mixing and matching without a recipe. If you're kind of new to cooking, you might want to learn some of those flavor families, you know, where you think, okay, if I'm making a Korean dish, what are some vegetables that are typically going to go with that flavor profile? So, you know, you might have radishes, some kind of bitter greens, um, things like that you know, throw in some gochujang, some fish sauce, that sort of thing. Um, for Mexican food, you think, okay, maybe I have some citrus, some limes I could use, some cilantro, and get to know um, which things tend to go with each other flavor-wise. 
So a great example of a versatile staple food is beans. Canned beans is what I use, or you can cook them from dried. They can be used in salads as a burger, dip, soup, or even brownies. That picture is a black bean brownie, which I haven't tried, but I've heard is incredible. So if somebody's feeling adventurous, you could try making some black bean brownies and let us know how that goes. It helps to get comfortable with cooking some flexible dishes without a recipe. I like making soups and stews with whatever's left in the fridge or pantry, but other folks like to do frittatas or casseroles. Are there any dishes that you guys like to make without a recipe? I like to do chili is something that I, I usually do without a recipe. Um, mac and cheese. I like to dress up mac and cheese. Oh, egg foo young. That's a good one. I've never made that before. I should try that. Any other ideas? Quiche. Yes, quiche. See, I always do frittatas because I don't know how to make uh, crust. <laughs> but if you're good with crusts, you could make a quiche. That's a good idea. You can throw all sorts of vegetables and meat into that. Awesome, keep those ideas coming. We'll move on to giving you some recipe ideas. So here are some of my family's favorite pantry pasta dishes. I had to look up how to pronounce this, but I love pasta fagioli right now. So that's a soup made with pasta, um, carrots, other celery, those kind of vegetables, and then beans and some smoked sausage. Um, delicious so easy. It's pretty hard to go wrong with that. Um, another thing I like to do is a basic baked ziti, which is really just pasta, cream cheese, and tomato sauce, and then whatever frozen meat and vegetables I have on hand. Um, today we'll be doing pasta puttanesca. That's a classic one. But tuna casserole is another good one. Oh, Denise says store-bought pie crust in the package lasts a long time in the fridge and is great for quiche. Good tip. I've never tried that, but I, I could give that a try. Pantry stews. So stews are a classic pantry meal and I'd recommend mastering a couple new ones if you're up for it. My favorite comfort food right now is lentil kielbasa stew, which packs a lot of protein, which is really important. Um, it has a lot of flavor and it's an easy dish. As I mentioned, chili is another go-to. And I recently discovered some new chili recipes that can mix things up so I don't get bored. Like white bean chicken chili is one of the easiest things I've ever made. It takes like four or five cans and an onion and garlic and that's pretty much it. And it was one of the most delicious things I ever had. So if you're bored with the chili you make, try mixing it up. We've got some ideas here. Pumpkin chili, pork chili with bok choy, pepperoni pizza chili. I've seen that one has won a number of chili cook-offs before. So that's a, a good one to try and learn some new variations. Soups are also great. Um, one of my favorites is pumpkin or sweet potato soup with ginger. And of course, salads are another great option for a fast, flexible, and healthy meal. I love a simple bean and corn salad with red onion, ideally with lime juice and cilantro. That's like one of my favorite salads. Another option I tried recently is tuna couscous salad, which comes together in 10 minutes because you have that quick cooking couscous, which is a great thing to keep on hand in your pantry if you haven't tried that before. All right, now that you've gotten some recipe ideas, I'd like to challenge you all to see how long you can go without grocery shopping. And I can tell you that I've been trying this lately and I have saved a ton of money as well as learning some new dishes. So I think that it is a perfect time to practice pantry cooking since the holidays are coming and we all want to save a little money and probably clear out some room in our fridge and freezer for Thanksgiving leftovers. So give it a try and see how long you can go. All right, so I'm just gonna take a minute to get set up to finish our workshop with a couple cooking demonstrations we'll be making chickpea peanut stew and pasta puttanesca. So while I get set up, please feel free to unmute yourself to ask any questions or make comments about your thoughts on pantry cooking.
wanted to mention to Elaine, if you're gonna do the squash in the Instapot, make sure you stab it all over so it's vented, just like baked potato when you stab it, make sure it's vented before you put it in your Instapot. Good advice. I'm always scared of my Instapot. I know I shouldn't be. I but. wanted to make it clear because I stabbed mine everywhere. <laughs> it turned out fine. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. Actually, it was for my uh, granddaughter because like two weeks ago, I think we went marketing and she bought the spaghetti squash so she wanted to make something, but not knowing what she was going to make. So, you know, like last week I went over to the house and I still saw it on the, on the pantry, on the counter, you know. Right. What are you going to make with that? They say, oh, I don't know. I don't know how, you know. So I thought maybe I'll give them a good idea and at least how to cook it. I think it's once not... it's cooked, she probably would know what to do with it or she can find something to do with it. But yeah, there's lots of ways to finish it. I just, I used it like spaghetti. I put a little spaghetti sauce and parm cheese on top with the salt and pepper and things like that. Uh -huh. Yeah. It turned out delicious. Fact is, we had enough for two dinners. So four meals out of one squash, I think is pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh -huh. All right, can you guys hear me okay? You yes. guys, yes, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, just let me know if you need me to speak up. Um, but I think we're ready to get started, so. We're going to start by making some chickpea peanut stew, which is one of my favorite dishes. So I'm heating up my pot right now. I've got a little bit of olive oil in there and we're going to start by cooking our aromatics. So I've got one onion chopped up Ooh, and then- I'm, I'm wondering if you could go back to the screen where you're, you're full on the screen. Can you see both? I see the gallery, I see everybody. Oh, um, I'm not sure why that is. Um, is everybody else, if you're on your computer, are you seeing things okay? I see both screens, yeah. Okay, you should be seeing both screens. If you're on a phone, you might have to switch, um, swipe to see between the two views, but right now I have it spotlighted. Um, can you change to speaker view and see if that that helps? I did. Thank you. Okay, perfect. All right. No problem. <laughs> Gives me a little time to get the oil hot. So as I mentioned, we're going to start with some chopped onion as well as ginger and garlic. And so our ginger and garlic are going to be minced up pretty finely so that they quick quickly cook when we add them to our hot oil. And that's going to make a nice flavor base for our stew. Could now, you use... if you're really pantry cooking and you don't even have fresh garlic or ginger, you could try using ground ginger and garlic and garlic powder. Um, that'll probably change the flavor somewhat, but it'll at least give you some of those flavors still. They also sell it frozen now, ginger oh, and garlic. That's Little a cubes. great idea. Already minced up. <laughs> oh, that'll save you some time. That's nice. Good to know. I've never tried that. I'll have to see. I wonder if it changes the flavor to have it frozen first. But if you did that, you'd pretty much never run out of these fresh ingredients. So these are the only fresh ingredients that we're going to be using in this recipe. Um, if you keep green onions, if you grow green onions in your garden, you could also try using the white parts of green onions to add that onion flavor and then top it with some sliced green onions. That's another option. All right, so I'm waiting to see, all right, that shimmering happening with the oil to show that it's getting hot. Tossing in a couple of these little pieces of onion to see when they start simmering or sauteing so that I know it's time to add everything else. And after that, we're just going to cook them for about a minute. We want to make sure most importantly that you do not burn your garlic. 
burning your garlic will pretty much ruin your dish. <laughs> that's <laughs> one, of the, one of the things you will learn the hard way. Um, so that's why if you're cutting up your garlic really finely, you're really only going to cook it for a minute, maybe two minutes. You're going to keep a really close eye on it to be stirring it constantly. So you make sure that it does not get too dark brown. That's kind of too far. It'll get really bitter. Um, the taste of the taste of burned garlic is hard to undo. All right, there we go. Hear that sizzle? That means that our oil is just as hot as it should be. All right. So give that a quick stir. We're gonna let that cook for a minute. And we're gonna get ready for our next steps. So the next thing we're going to add is a can of tomato paste. So I don't know about you, but whenever I use a recipe that calls for tomato paste, they always say to use like one tablespoon and then you're left with the rest of this jar and you don't know what to do with it. So when I made this recipe, I just put in the whole jar of tomato paste. And it makes it really tomato-y, but I kind of like that. It's a really rich flavored dish, so I think it can hold up to that. So when these have been cooking for about a minute, the onions are gonna start to get translucent. We're checking to make sure our garlic isn't burning. And when we add this in and cook it before we add the rest of our liquids, we're just giving it a chance to um, sort of caramelize a little bit, to add some sweetness to the tomato paste so it's not just that raw tomato flavor. If you're in a rush and you don't wanna do it, you just wanna dump everything in at once, that's fine too. All right. Gonna get my tomato paste ready and toss that in. All right, so this is one that you also wanna try and cook quickly, make sure that you're not burning it. But you'll see it turns into this nice sort of uh, paste with the rest of these aromatics and just gets a chance to meld with those other flavors. And we'll let that cook for a second while we prepare everything else. So the liquids that we're going to be adding to add the body of this stew are chicken stock. I use one whole carton of these or if you don't have chicken stock at home you can use a bouillon cube and then just a few cups of water to however, how much you want. Um, I usually say about four cups. So a lot of times that's what I'll do because I don't usually keep chicken stock on hand. So I'll just put a bouillon cube and four cups of water. Bouillon cubes are a great pantry staple for that reason. Of course, if you want to keep it vegetarian or vegan, you could skip the chicken stock and do a vegetable broth. That would work as well. And then to add the creaminess to this, we're going to be adding one can of unsweetened coconut milk. So that's gonna make this really thick and rich. And then I also like to add one can of diced tomatoes. You can use fresh tomatoes if you have those as well. So, all right, this has had a chance, I think, to caramelize a little bit along the bottom. Going to toss in a tablespoon of chili powder. If you don't like spice, you might want to do a little less than a tablespoon, but I wouldn't leave it out completely because it's a pretty important flavor profile. You could substitute other kinds of um, chilies. For example, I've used chipotle chili powder before and that's been really good. 
we're going to stir that along the bottom really quick so it sort of gets a chance to toast a little bit, add a little more depth of flavor. Now we're going to add all of those liquids. So, one carton of chicken stock. One can of unsweetened coconut milk. Oop. Don't splatter it all over yourself. Give that a stir. Now I'm gonna increase the heat on this because we're gonna wanna try and bring it to a simmer. And then I'm also going to add a can of diced tomatoes. These are fire roasted tomatoes. They just add a little bit more flavor than the plain diced tomatoes, but they don't have to be fire roasted. Then to add some salt and umami flavor, I like to add one tablespoon of fish sauce. If you wanted to make this vegan, you could do shoyu instead of fish sauce, but I really prefer the tiny hint of fishiness and umami that you get from the fish sauce. All right, stirring that together. Now, as this is coming to heat, I'm gonna add the rest of our ingredients. We're going to do one cup of peanut butter. So this is the fancy organic kind, unsalted, so it won't have any extra sugar or salt. If all you have is Skippy or something, that's fine too, though. And finally, the star ingredient two cans of chickpeas. So to prepare those, you pretty much just open the cans and drain them. They don't need to be rinsed or anything like that. But that's gonna add a lot of great protein to this dish that already has a lot of protein because of that peanut butter. And you guys probably know that as you get older, protein is really important to make sure that you're not losing muscle. You wanna try and eat protein throughout the day um, and actually most people already eat enough meat. And so you wanna try and get more protein from non-meat sources. So chickpeas and beans, legumes are a great way to add protein um, as well as things like seafood. All right, so this is almost ready. Once it comes to a simmer, we're gonna keep stirring it so that it kind of, especially the peanut butter has a chance to meld with all the other ingredients. Once it's simmering, we'll be adding some greens and some frozen mixed vegetables. And you can always add fresh greens or fresh mixed vegetables if you have those on hand. But if you're like me and you're not great at keeping those on hand, frozen is fine. And that makes it almost entirely a pantry dish made with non-perishables. So while we wait for this to come to a simmer, um, I just thought I'd tell you about where this recipe came from. Um, it's actually inspired by West African chicken peanut stew. I don't know if any of you have ever had a chance to have that before, um, but it's kind of a classic West African dish. Um, I studied abroad in Ghana when I was in college and perhaps one of my best memories was my roommate teaching me how to make chicken peanut stew in our dorm room. And of course it wasn't quite as healthy. There was a lot of chicken in it. She used chicken feet in hers actually. And instead of using chili powder, she used fresh chilies. And if you happen to have fresh chilies, like if you have Hawaiian chili pepper, you could always do that for the spice instead of the chili powder. Um, but this is a nice vegan version of that kind of classic dish. 
Um, so if you are trying to be a little healthier, this is a good option. When I was vegan, I used to make this every few weeks. It makes a lot of food. It's extremely filling. Um, it does have a lot of calories, so that's something to be aware of, but it's um, a really comforting, uh, heavy dish that's nice for especially cold, rainy nights if you guys are having some of those right now. All right, looks like we're starting to get a little hot here. So we're gonna get ready for our last couple of ingredients. So mixed vegetables are fine. You could do a bag of whatever you have on hand. Um, I actually ended up buying these steam in the bag mixed vegetables because they were what was cheapest at the store. That's fine to do. Um, you could do just corn. You could do a mix of green beans and carrots. If you happen to have canned mixed vegetables on hand, that would be fine to do as well. Um, I bought a bag of this cut leaf spinach, um, but you could use collard greens or kale, either frozen or fresh, um, those would all be fine. You also can leave out greens if you don't happen to have them, but I find that they make a nice complement to the flavors in this stew. Um, and they're just a nice way of adding a little bit of extra protein, or sorry, um, nutrition into the dish. So. Once we start seeing a little bit of simmering action going on, that's when we can go ahead and add our frozen vegetables. They're generally not going to take very long to cook at all, so you don't wanna add them too soon. That's the only thing to be aware of. You don't really wanna end up with mushy frozen vegetables. So once you have a bit of a simmer happening, you can see it's thickening up. We'll add in our frozen vegetables. And it'll just take a few minutes for these to cook and for the stew to get back up to the heat we want. And that's pretty much it. You can see really quick, the only fresh ingredients you need are those onion, garlic, and ginger. Filling meal, pretty affordable. Can be vegan very easily. And it's got, it's a really attractive dish. So I think it's actually even nice enough to do when you're having guests over, um, you can serve this. So you could either serve it with cooked rice is one thing you could do. Um, or you could just serve it on its own, like a stew. And what I like to do is garnish it with some cilantro, if you happen to have some cilantro on hand. Um, fresh lime is another great flavor punch that you can add when you're serving it. Um, but if you don't have those things, trust me, when you make this dish for the first time, it's got so much flavor. You can tell how that you can pretty much add whatever vegetables or other mild ingredients you have on hand and they'll just sort of meld into the flavor of the dish without causing too much issue. So I'm just gonna serve a little bit of this so you can see how it looks. but really colorful. And then you can garnish it with a wedge of lime and a little bit of cilantro. And there you go. That's made almost entirely from your pantry. All right, any questions while I get us ready for our next dish? I was wondering if you used creamy peanut butter or chunky, and would there be an advantage to have little chunks of peanuts in it, or would that not taste good? <laughs> I think it's fine. I used chunky, and I usually use chunky when I make this. If you're the kind of person who really doesn't like 
chunky peanut butter, you could absolutely do it with creamy and that would be fine. But no, I don't think there's any problem with doing it with um, chunky peanut butter. Anybody else? All right, we're gonna move on to our next recipe, pasta puttanesca. So if you're gonna be cooking along with us, you just need to make your pasta beforehand. This dish we like to make with a long pasta. So either spaghetti or linguine is usually what we like to use. Um, and so if you're gonna be cooking along with us, you can just have that ready. Otherwise, let's start cooking. Now, this is a really quick one. Um, the only fresh ingredients we need for pasta puttanesca is garlic. So This is kind of a classic Italian dish. Um, you can make variations to it, but uh, for the most part, it's going to be very similar to any recipe you find online. So it's pretty much anchovies, garlic, kawamata olives, and capers in a tomato sauce. So those are the really flavorful and salty ingredients that are going to make the base of this. So. If you don't like anchovies, this might not be the dish for you, but I would recommend giving it a try because you might be surprised that the anchovies really sort of melt into the rest of the sauce and just give it a lot of that umami flavor. So um, you might be surprised that you like it even if you're not a big fan of anchovies. So I'm just heating up some olive oil here right now and then I'm going to be adding some sliced garlic. So in our last recipe, we minced it. This time we're going to slice it because we don't want it to burn and it's going to be cooking for a little bit longer than the aromatics were in our last one. So let's see, um, Martha asked about the heat for the oil. So for this, um, I actually have this on the highest heat setting, but that's just because it's a very weak stove. Um, you're going to have to find what temperature works for your own stovetop. Um, you want to have it sizzling, but not going crazy when you add any kind of liquid. So um, you can see the oil is shimmering. I added one piece of garlic and it's, um, it's already frying a little bit there. So that's how I usually gauge if it's hot enough for me to add my ingredients. And also the sound, the sound of the garlic hitting the oil. If it's sizzling really readily, then it's the right heat. So give that a shake. And while those cook, I'm going to get my anchovies ready. So this recipe calls for one two ounce can of anchovies. Um, so that is about six fillets. If you can see here, these are, um, about five or six fillets all stuck together. You can use or add the oil that they come packed in, um, but I'm choosing not to just because I think that might add just a little bit of extra salt because um, the anchovies are already really salty. So I'm just using the regular olive oil rather than the olive oil it comes in. So you can see we're getting a little bit of browning happening on our garlic. So I'm gonna go ahead and add the anchovies. All right. Oops, I forgot my spoon. <laughs> All right. So what's going to happen with these anchovies is they're going to pretty much dissolve into this sauce as they cook. And again, keeping a close eye on this garlic to make sure that it is not going to burn. All 
All right. Give this a stir. You can see how the anchovies are already breaking apart. And it's going to kind of turn into this garlicky anchovy paste. So that's going to be the base of the dish. Now, as soon as these are ready, we're going to add our liquid to stop the cooking so that we don't burn our garlic or our anchovies. All right, you can see how the anchovies are all breaking apart. I think we're about ready to add our tomato sauce. So this is 28 ounces of crushed tomatoes. You can also use diced tomatoes. I like the crushed because it's more uniform and saucy. So I'm just going to stir this all together and we're still heating it on a medium high heat to come kind of bring this to a simmer so that these ingredients can meld together. As that's heating up, we're going to add the rest of our ingredients. So we have a quarter cup of drained capers. So these have salt in them as well as the anchovies. We'll add those in. Also half a cup of sliced Kalamata olives. So if you have the just pitted whole olives, you just might want to slice them up a little bit so that you get more bite-sized pieces. Add those in. Those also have salt. So this is a really salty dish naturally. I definitely wouldn't add salt to it until you have a chance to taste it. Um, because a lot of times I find it doesn't need any salt at all. So we'll stir those in. Now for our seasonings. We're going to have a teaspoon of dried oregano and half a teaspoon of crushed dried red pepper. Now you're going to be surprised at how spicy this dish gets with just that half teaspoon of crushed red pepper. So if you don't like spice, I would either leave it out or just do a sprinkle to taste at the end. Um, but if you like spicy food, you can stick with the whole half teaspoon. So we'll add those into our sauce. You can see it's already starting to simmer. Give it a stir. And it's kind of up to you. If you're in a hurry, you can serve this dish right now as is, and it'll be really delicious. If you want those flavors to have a chance to meld a little bit more, you can simmer it for about eight to 10 minutes. And I know we were talking before about how important protein is. So seafood is a great way to do that. Anchovies a couple of times a week are a nice way to add in a little bit of extra protein. Anchovies have some of the highest levels of omega-3s of fish out there, and also some of the lowest mercury levels because they are really um, low on the food chain. They mostly eat plankton. So anchovies are a great thing to kind of integrate into your diet a little bit um, if you don't mind the taste or if you could learn to love them. Like one of my friends thought she didn't like anchovies, but once she'd had a few different recipes with them, she learned actually maybe it was more the way it was prepared that was the problem. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and turn this off so we can plate up our final dish. So you can either put your pasta straight into the sauce um, and mix that around or spoon out a serving on top of your pasta. And for garnishes, if you do have fresh herbs, this is a great meal for fresh herbs. Parsley is great as a garnish and adds a nice little bitter, bitter flavor. Um, basil is another one that would be really great with this. Uh, grated Parmesan is also something folks like to do, but it's also great without cheese. So whatever works for you. All right, there we go. Any questions? Well, I guess with the noodles, it'll cut some of that saltiness from the sauce, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you'll notice we didn't add any broth or water to this. So it's a very concentrated sauce. 
it's really just the tomatoes that make that sauce. So that's why it's a very rich and salty sauce, but you don't need much of it to give flavor to the dish. So that little, that scoopful you saw me adding to this big pot, this big bowl of pasta, it would be more than enough to coat all of those with some nice flavor. Anything else? That was, that was quick. I like quick dishes. Yes, this yeah. is definitely one of the quickest dishes you can make. Throw everything in. <laughs> yeah, so pretty much you just have to keep on hand capers and the Kalamata olives and tomatoes, which I always have on hand anyway, and garlic. So, and, and anchovies. So it's like maybe five ingredients that you have to just make sure you always have in your pantry and you can always throw it together in a pinch. And again, look how beautiful that is. You know, you could absolutely serve that to guests if you wanted to as well. They don't have to know what's in it. Sorry? They don't have to know what's in it. <laughs> it's, <laughs> <Yeah>. it's good. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I, I have friends and family who love fish. So I think they're gonna go crazy for this. I'm serving it for lunch after this. I love anchovies though. Me too. And the health benefits, I mean, especially I like to say because um, I'm still breastfeeding, I have to be really careful about the fish that I eat, but I know I want to eat a lot of fish for those omega-3s, those healthy fats. Um, so low mercury fish like anchovies, sardines are really great options for me. Maria, do you have that bottle of the, ol um, the olives? <laughs> um, if you hang on a second, I do. So I just bought this jar of the sliced Greek Kalamata olives. And one of these recipes only uses about a quarter of this jar. Um, so this can last you many recipes and it lasts a long time in your fridge. Um, you can use it for like pasta salads as well. In a pinch, if you just have like black olives in a can, you could probably use that. It wouldn't taste quite the same, but at least you'd still get that texture. Can I ask you how you um how you buy your dried herbs? Is it in the bottles or do you buy small quantities? Um, I buy small quantities because you know they say that actually um you you really only want to keep things like dried herbs for about a year before they really start to lose their flavor. Um. So if you're like me, I do not replace my dried herbs every year, but if you really want that peak flavor, supposedly that's what you're really supposed to try and do. Um, so, you know, you could buy them in bulk and then put them in the freezer and that might help extend, extend their shelf life um, and only take out a little bit of what you need periodically. Well, so if you keep it in the freezer, it can last how long, you think? Um, probably indefinitely. Oh, okay. In the freezer, it's one of those things where it's like, it might not be peak quality, but in theory, you could keep it in there for a long time. All right, so I think in another Zoom, they kind of talked about that. And um, I don't know if it was- um, Bonnie, Bonnie um, Teeples did uh, um, uh, one on um, herbs to freeze, what to freeze, what to keep. I thought it was maybe on Susan's. Uh, um, oh, Susan too. She had, and I, that was one of the questions I asked because I keep all of my herbs and spices in the freezer and um, it's been there for years. And one suggestion was that if this, there is still the smell of it, it's okay. But once they're losing the smell, then you may need to replace it. Yes, I think that's a really good rule of thumb, you know, for spices and herbs. Just give it a whiff. If it doesn't have any scent, it's probably not going to have any flavor either. In small quantities, you can buy like from the natural food store or something. 
Yeah. yeah. I've done that. that. I've made um, this pickled garlic and it just, it's, it uh, asks for you know, all the kind of herbs that I don't have. And you just go there and you just kind of like guesstimate how much you need. And surprisingly, you know, I just scooped the amount that I actually needed. So I was good guesstimation, but yeah, not your food store. Yeah. And personally, the only, we were talking about this before the meeting, but I usually only use dried oregano. I don't generally use that many other dried herbs. I'm sure you could, um, but I don't know many recipes uh, besides the dried oregano, which I put in almost every Italian dish that I make. 